Richard Nancy will be speaking about silver. Uh, um, I already <laughs> heard uh, some years ago speaking about it. So, we're very good to. Let's see if I can. Okay, that's great. Microphone. I'm not sure. I want to have this slide. I'm trying. If it's possible. There's a little symbol in the bottom, one way to do it. No, yeah. The problem is to find the oh, arrow. Yeah, the arrow is lost somehow. Ah, there you are. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, I already gave a talk on silver a few years ago. Uh, and this today would be a kind of a continuation of that paper. Since, since that, I, I, have conti I have continued my research on, on, on silver. That was just the beginning of this journey with silver, my silver journey. <laughs> anyway, so, it's, so I continued the research and now I will try to collect all the infos or data that I find significant in the context of his life and, and, and work. So, uh, Zilberer was a Viennese psychoanalyst who is primarily known for his theories in symbol formation, in the film, field of symbol formation. Uh, he introduced the so-called functional category of symbols. And uh, this idea basically proved to be a very valuable and interesting contribution to psychoanalysis. He was a very, very prolific author and also a member of Freud's inner circle. And it seems that uh, even though he is not in the core of interest today among psychoanalysts, he was able to inspire several important scholars in the field of psychoanalysis, like, for example, Carl Gustav Jung, or even Jean Piaget, even Jacques Lacan uh, 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 wrote something on Zilberer. So he had a surprisingly interesting, I wouldn't say significant, but a, an, an influence on several scholars later. So this functional symbolism is a, it's a kind of an innovation of the theory of symbol formation. You probably know that in classical psychoanalysis, a, a symbol emerges when something is repressed and the symbol is the manifestation of the repressed content in a way. The, the repressed content has a lot to do with sexuality or other um, unconscious elements. Uh, according to the functional uh, category or theory of symbols, um, uh, different com conditions of the subject or different modes of functioning of consciousness can be symbolized, uh, can appear in a symbolic form. And here's a definition from Silberer, and I, I quote, the functional category is characterized by the fact that the condition, um, structure, or capacity for work of the individual consciousness is itself portrayed. It is termed functional because it has nothing to do with the material or the contents of the act of thinking, but applies merely to manner and method in which consciousness functions, like for example, rapid, slow, easy, hard, obstructed, and so on, end of quote. Yeah, he added further innovations, like for example, he also, as Jung, he also arrived to the collective nature of several symbols. He called these symbols so-called elementary types, that a concept that is really close to the idea of archetypes. Um, he was especially interested in symbols representing death or rebirth in this context. He interpreted symbols as imaginative abbreviations, um, abbreviations or points of contact that exist between the phenomena of the world and the, and, and the mind. He had a distinct theory on this, but I won't talk about this today. 
Alchemy was a very significant field for, for Zilberer. He reinterpreted alchemical procedures in psychoanalytic contexts. Uh, his aim was simply to demonstrate these, that these processes, these alchemical procedures, represent nothing else but psychological processes, psychological functions. He was not the only one who, who, who addressed this idea. From the 18th century, there were some authors, not of course not in psychoanalysis, who addressed this possibility, and he continued basically this train of thought. Functional symbolism, according to uh, Zilberer, could um, itself could be interpreted as a mirroring function of the self, of the psyche, um, and he also attributed a great therapeutic significance to this possible mirroring function, and he applied his theory very uh, frequently in his own psychoanalytic practice. <laughs> Sorry. You probably know that, that he was also in esotericism, and this is a huge, very interesting area. Actually, today, for me, at least, it looks that he was deeply, really deeply involved in esotericism. It's not an exaggeration to say that he was a, basically a true occultist, but also a very uh, committed psychoanalytic thinker, and he wanted to combine these, these fields. Um, he was interested pri primarily in the symbolism of several esoteric currents, like especially uh, Freemasonry and alchemy, and also Rosicrucianism. Um, esoteric teachings, philosophies, um, and practices provided an excellent empirical background for his investigations. So he was not a kind of an esoteric thinker who wanted to introduce a concept of the spiritual nature of the psyche. He was he, he neither belonged to the group of, of early parapsychologists who wanted to experiment with these extraordinary uh, uh, phenomena and experiences. Rather, he, he, he just used esotericism as, a, as an empirical basis, as an, as an empirical background for the understanding of, of functional symbolism in, in theory and also in practice. Uh, so his significance, I think, is quite obvious for several reasons. This is just a summary here that, that basically uh, his discoveries emerged very explicitly out of the interaction between esotericism and psychoanalysis. In his works, we can see that he is using psychoanalytic concepts and interpretation in the field of esoteric experiences. And by this, on the basis of this, he's able to develop a special form of psychological thinking. And in this way, his, his life work is a very good example of the creative influence of esotericism on psychoanalysis and psychology. Um, back to the data, there are very interesting uh, 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 well, sources in this regard. Uh, originally, he belonged to the Catholic Church, but after leaving the Catholic Church in 1909, he applied for a charter at the Martinist Order in, in Paris. Um, it's also very likely that his interest in Rosicrucianism and alchemy was also linked to, to, to Martinism and to his affiliation with Martinism. He longed to a Masonic lodge, to, to, uh, to Freemasonry too, Socrates, located in, in Vienna. This is clear and we have many evidence here. Um, and he was interested in many different forms of occult and esoteric practices. As Schlegel, who was a close friend of Zilberer, writes, he was intensively occupied with pure psychology, but not in an experimental sense, really. He studied astrology, tried to prove the remote influence of the stars on the individual, and, and made profound studies in alchemy. He made many sexual, sexual magical experiments and also arrived to Raja Yoga exercises. Well, um, 
this Raja Yoga usually requires a great experience. So usually beginners are not in Raja Yoga. <laughs> that, that's a sign that probably he was very deeply involved. And also an interesting element here is the sexual magi magical part of his, of his practice. We know very little about this. Actually, I just know rumors. <laughs> about this, but nothing just, uh, 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 very objective, but it seems that he was involved. It, it's, it seems to be very likely that he used these techniques too, techniques too, which were and are very present in occult practices. So he was a, well, an interesting person. Uh, and he tried to somehow use his experiences in the field of psychoanalytic practice too. With the supervision of Stekel, of Stek uh, Wilhelm Stekel, uh, he conducted some, not too much, but some psychoanalytic therapies too. For, uh, in this, usually he followed a strict psychoanalytic interpretation, except for the fact that he introduced a new method. This was a kind of a diagnostic method, but also a psychotherapeutic practice, lacanomancy. Lacanomancy, which uh, was basically in lacanomancy, the, the, the patient or the subject had to gaze into a basin of water uh, 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 on the surface of the water. And uh, um, it was similar to the practice, practice of staring into a crystal ball, basically. And Zilberer uh, waited for uh, images that arrived uh, based on this, this practice. So he experimented um, with some patients, and the most important one was a patient called Leah, and recorded several of his, her visions through lacanomancy, through this method of, of, of gazing into uh, a basin of, of, of water. Uh, to illuminate this, I can give you an example, a uh, uh, quotation from Zilberer. I quote, I carried out my experiment under conditions which according to occultists promote clairvoyance and possibly actually favor telepathic phenomena and which, owing to the subject's psychic state, were calculated to promote internal experiences. These internal ex experiences could have some connection to collective symbols, but also reflected to the, the current state of the patient, psychological state of the, of the patient. He went further and started to interpret occult visions on the basis of functional symbolism. I quote again, it happens quite frequently that the vision has an exclusive purpose to portray the soul. So the occult vision in this sense is nothing else but a functional symbol, in fact. This reflection is a reflection in a mirror in which the ego is reflected by the ego with all its emotions and motions, drives, fears, sentiments, longings, guilty feelings, fights, passions, inhibitions, splits, end of quote. So, that was the theory, and now let's see the circumstances. <laughs> uh, when we are making, making the secondary literature that discusses Zilberer, most of, often we see that, that his life work has, the evaluation of his life work was never really independent <laughs> from the circumstances surrounding Zilberer's death. Um, it was Paul Rosen who first integrated uh, uh, into a story about Freud, Zilberer's suicide, according to which the rejection of Freud led to Zilberer's suicide, and this way Freud is responsible for this. And maybe you know this letter um, that is quoted by, by Rosen. Uh, now I read again. Freud's dismissal, as Rosen writes, of Zilberer was curt and official. In one short letter, we can see a miniature of exaggerated version of Freud's earlier methods of getting rid of troublesome students. I must add here that in the beginning, Freud liked Zilberer. He later, over the years, became more critical, but, but in the beginning, he, he supported him. And this is the letter of Freud. Dear sir, I request that you do not make the intended visit with me as the result of the observations and impressions of recent years. I no longer desire personal contact with you. Very truly yours, Freud. <laughs> 
later, later Zilberer killed himself as, as Rosen writes in a horrible way. Nine months, nine months later, he hanged himself on a set of window bars, leaving a flashlight shining in his face as he strangled so his wife could see him when she came home. Yeah, that's the famous text of Rosen. So, but there are some data again, which refer to the possibility that maybe it was not Freud alone. There were other problems too in, in Zilderer's life. And maybe the most important element here is that it's a very likely, almost sure, that this letter was not written to Herbe, but to his father, Victor Zilderer, who was a very well-known figure of the Viennese life uh, in the early 20th century. It was Bert Nitschke who proved this, yeah, uh, uh, almost 30 years ago. Um, Herbert Zilderer, furthermore, uh, was, was, was not really devoted to Freud, not, especially not in the 1920s. He even founded an independent psychoanalytic journal with Steckel, and in this journal he criticized Freud very, very often. So, yeah, maybe he was hurt, but he also criticized Freud. Zilberer was not excluded from the inner circle of psychoanalysis. That's also important. Two months before his death, he attended the meeting of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. He also voted. So again, Freud excluded his enemies most often. Yeah, back to Steckel. Uh, and now, yeah, I talk about this part. He, in, it, he thought that when he tried to search for an answer to the, to the suicide, he referred to Silver's potential unresolved conflict and also his flee from the psychoanalytic treatment. Uh, I also examined the necrologies of the, of the popular press and all of them emphasized the so-called fit of mental derangement in the background of Zilberer's acts or um, a kind of a nervous disorder that was present and emerged or increased during the, the, the preceding years. Um, a further important element that not really Zilberer was uh, subjected to public and sometimes very rude attacks by journalists or contemporary writers. And these authors often called him and ridiculed him, uh, uh, called uh, him a telepa because of his interest in mysticism and the occult. So he was a kind of a public figure and his father was also a problematic person. And I think that might be taken into consideration. So here's the father. It's worth knowing that his father was an extraordinary talent, a very well-known figure of Vienna. Uh, he was a real self-made man, a very wealthy person and an influential person, not only an editor, but also an author, a sportsman, a businessman, a politician, an innovator, basically everything. That man was everything. A pioneer in, in Austrian airship travel, in ballooning, uh, also, <laughs> the other also, and this man gazed upon Herbert, his son, with great, great expectations. And he very clearly stated that, that he wanted Herbert to, yeah, to somehow continue, to, to be a continuation of him. Uh, from the very beginning, for the purpose of this, Herbert, Herbert received the, uh, an outstanding education, really. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, well, it seems very likely that, that he was also educated or lived under a certain pressure coming from his father and the broader environment too. Um, another important element here is that Herbert was never able to become financially independent of his father. And maybe that's also important to, to consider this. A little addition here. Um, I tried to find the grave, uh, the gravestone of Zilberer, but I couldn't find that in the Vienna cemetery. And it turned out that it was raised in, in uh, 1991 because there was nobody who would have paid for the for the gravesite. Um, but I found some further materials, and it seemed that on the original gravestone there were some occult symbols. These exactly these symbols: the symbol of sun 
sulfur, earth, and mercury. Of course, this also refers to his, to his deep involvement in esotericism. His father's uh, 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 monument, really a lavish monument, monument is still there. And the, yeah, thank you. And it was not the father, but his wife who paid for the funeral. So what I wanted to tell you is that there is this story about Freud, and maybe it's worth uh, yeah, adding further levels of interpretation here. I'm not saying that, that, uh, that, that Silvera wasn't heard by Freud, but there are other, other layers too of this story too. A further very interesting chapter of this research, but I, I don't have time to talk about this, so I won't, is the influence uh, of Zilberon upon Jung, because well, the similarities are quite obvious between the two theories, and it's really it would be nice to do uh, a more detailed research on this. Some scholars have already did this and done this, and uh, they are very, quite radical in their opinion, and they say that it was Zilberer who who, for example, called attention to the significance of alchemy. You also agreed at this. So, as a conclusion, I don't want to say anything very complicated. I just wanted to call attention again to the significance of, of Zilberer's work, not only in the context of esotericism, but also as a distinct theory that is worth investigating. Um, and yeah, it, he killed himself 100 years ago, and maybe I am a bit pathetic here. I'm sorry, but maybe it's time to, to, to appreciate his life work based upon its own merits. OK, thank you. Uh, one of Silver and Yugi is a very complicated history since also uh, there is another complication, the fact that Freud mentioned Silver about the anagogic interpretation of dreams very early, probably also not to mention Jung. Mm -hmm. So it's, <laughs> it would be very difficult to understand the, the, the real story in, mm. in, in all this. Anyway, just, uh, just uh, yeah, that's, that's some questions, because we, we turn to the dark side from uh, the psychoanalysis. <laughs> That's so it, it's it's sort of a comment that maybe more than a question that came to my mind when uh, um, you think about this very successful father and the student of psychoanalysis or student of mine, um, the famous essay by Karl Schorsk in uh, Fin de siècle Vienna about uh, Freud's dream about his father as a great failure suffering indignity mm -hmm. and and he kind of interprets a neurosis that fuels Freud's um, um, ambitious uh, search for success it's almost an obverse yes. or or backwards um, um, view of this unfortunate fellow yeah yeah I, I, I agree and maybe that you know, turning towards psychoanalysis and esotericism could maybe could have been a kind of a, um, I don't know, an opposition uh, to the to the father because probably the father was not very happy about oh. this. <laughs> yeah. Julia, thank you for your presentation. You propose that his uh, theory was very influenced to Jung, of course, but also to Piaget and Lacan. Yeah. In what sense it was yes. important to it, it, it was not fundamental, of course. And Piaget, it's just basically, he referred to, to Zilber as one of the most outstanding thinkers of the theory of symbolism, and he also added that his tragic suicide, unfortunately, and so on. But it's it's not really fundamental. I, I wouldn't say that. He they just they just reacted on, on Zilber's innovation and they asked, for example, Piaget evaluated it as a very well, as a very high level contribution to the theory of symbolism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, sorry, at Lacan, it's much more complicated. He 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 uses Zilber, uh, I think, for the sake of interpreting symbolism in general, but 
to be honest, that was too complicated for me. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> uh, thank you for your talk. I was I was wondering about uh, the subject layer that you spoke about and um, if she was if this uh, looking in the basin or if it were uh, a treatment for some particular condition that he was addressing mm -hmm. with her. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's a good, good question. I, I didn't, uh, I couldn't elaborate this further, but, but basically he used this as like as a form of active imagination on, or any kind of imaginative tool in psychotherapy. So as a diagnostic tool that he was also able to somehow uh, refer back to previous images during the process of psychotherapy. So it, uh, it, it functioned very similarly to, to other forms of projective tools or projective testings. There was nothing very mystical in it or occult. It was just a technique, a surface given by this method. Thank you. Just a small question. <laughs> you can easily answer it, I think. Uh, is there any archival material left? You could navigate Silver's personal archive, his letters, yeah. notes, diaries. Do you know anything about that? Because that would, that might shed some light on yeah, his thinking. Yeah. Well, nothing. But, yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure yet. Until today, I, I, I haven't found these archival materials. I found a lot of materials in the archive of the National Library of, of, of Austria. There is a lot uh, on Zilberer too, on the early life of Zilberer and also about the father and uh, partially we can get, yep, yeah, of course this is partly a, a speculation, but we can somehow uh, uh, arrive to a story about the father and the son based on these, these materials, but the letters and further stuff, no, not not yet, I would say. I won't give up. He, he didn't have any children, so uh, it's it's difficult, but 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 I will continue this research, yeah. Could you do just a small question. Why would Freud write to the father of, of Silva? Yeah. Why, why did he do that? Uh, he knew the father, also knew the father, and the father was a very, yeah, some, somebody in the core, a, a very important figure, uh, uh, later connected to Karl Leuger, who, uh, uh, yes, Leuger. so that could, an anti-Semitist, uh, the anti-Semitic, uh, um, uh, Karl Leuger, and maybe that could have been one of the reasons why he didn't want to, to, to meet the father. But yeah, so I, I don't know too much about the personal affairs between the two. Anyway, it, it, he knew, he knew okay. the father. This is what we know. Thank you, Julia.